Well, hello, and we're glad that you have joined us today for our Sunday morning worship service here at Harlandale Christian Church. Uh, we have come together, we, we joined together to sing and to fellowship uh, about and from, for that wondrous story of the love of Jesus who died for you and for me. We're glad that everyone is here. We're glad for those who are joining with us online that we have this opportunity, this, this privilege of being able to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in this way. We're just thankful to God for all of his blessings and for uh, this privilege that we have to lift up his name in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The psalmist reminds us in Psalm 4, verses 6 and 8, how wonderful God is. The psalmist says, Many, Lord, are asking, Who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. In peace, O Lord, I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer as we worship him and as we begin this hour of praise and honor. Father in heaven, we thank you for the wondrous story that brings us into your fold, into a saving relationship with you, of this wondrous story of the love of your son, Jesus Christ, and of you, our God, our Father in heaven. We thank you for your protection, for your provision, for you, the safety that you provide for us and for your blessing upon us each and every day. Father, thank you for your presence here in our, in our time of worship through your Holy Spirit as he indwells us, as we've come together in your name, and he, as, as you indwell us individually in our hearts and our lives through your Spirit. Thank you for helping us and allowing us to dwell in safety and in your love. Father, receive our worship and our praise as we lift up your holy name. We love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen.
plants his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy snow, Messiah still.
At least once this past week, you almost certainly felt overwhelmed or inadequate, didn't you? Well, this time that we share in our communion service and our Lord's Supper is one that can help us to feel and know so much more and so much better. If you felt inadequate, if things were uncertain for you, you had at least one reason to give up or give in, to feel like the world was winning and you were just not good enough. Well, you know, the Ephesian Christians felt that way too, but consider what Paul's, uh, Paul wrote to them in Ephesians chapter one. He said, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ, God has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly world. That is, in Christ, he chose us before the world was made so that we would be his holy people, people without blame before him. Because of his love, God had already decided to make us his own children through Jesus Christ. That was what he wanted and what pleased him, and it brings praise to God because of his wonderful grace. God gave that grace to us freely in Christ, the one that he loves. In Christ, we're set free by the blood of his death, and so we have forgiveness of sins. How rich is God's grace that he has given to us so fully and freely. Again, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. This morning, as we gather around this communion table, we remember whose we are and what he has done for us. Knowing Christ and how much he values us should lift us up as nothing else can. As we take the, the emblems in this meal of this, this Lord's Supper, we're reminded of all that Christ did for us. And we can bask in these wonderful scriptural truths. You're chosen. You're loved. And you are free. Our communion hymn today is Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb of God to offer the sacrifice to forgive, and rede forgive our sins and redeem us. We'll partake of this bread and the cup of communion during this hymn. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your watch and your care. We thank you for your blessings upon us and we thank you for this opportunity that we have to share in this communion time as we participate in this Lord's Supper. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for making us free from our sins and the debts that we owe to you. Father, bless us as we partake and may we always remember your love and your grace I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
by noise and distraction. We must learn to remain faithful as we follow Christ. We model ourselves after those who have gone before us. And the early church was absolutely committed in their faith. They devoted themselves to four specific practices, teaching, fellowship, communion, and prayer all of which we still do to this very day, all of which require our devotion. Well, just as we have over the last two Sundays, we're going to read what Luke has recorded about the history of the early church as he wrote in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the, the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Well, I'm glad that you're back with us today, church. Glad to have you here as we tackle uh, week number three, sermon number three of our Devoted series. And our guiding text for this series this month has been Acts chapter 2, verse 42, where we learn that the early church was, de was devoted to these four specific practices of faith, teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread or communion, and prayer. We've already worked through teaching and fellowship, and today we'll be looking at the practice of breaking bread, also known as communion. 
And if you like eating, hosting, or sharing meals with others, then this is the practice for you. In fact, since all of us here generally eat a few meals every day, it could be uh, maybe the most accessible and most enjoyable of all the practices that we'll study together. But make no mistake, breaking bread with other believers is not simply about passing the mashed potatoes around a dinner table. It's a holy time of remembrance, praise, and community. And it's made possible by the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. N.T. Wright says this about all of this. He says, when Jesus wanted to explain to his disciples what his death was all about, he didn't give them a theory, he gave them a meal. So today, as we look at this practice of breaking bread, we also remember that it's only possible through Jesus Christ that we are even here today. He built the trail so that we could walk this path. And thankfully, he included food, meal, communion, as an integral part of this journey. Breaking bread or communion is incredibly important. Now here's why the early church was so stubbornly devoted and dedicated to breaking bread together. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 to 26 what Paul wrote to them. And he says, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So communion, this Lord's Supper, this initial breaking of bread in Acts chapter 2, is about remembering Jesus the Christ, his life, his sacrifice on the cross, his body broken for you and for me, his blood, the marker of a new and final covenant, that, was, that he created, that he left between God and man. It's about his death, his resurrection, his promise to return again for his church. That's you and me. Now these are realities for, for us as believers that we simply cannot forget. And because communion is implicitly done with others, it follows that we celebrate and we remember Jesus together. Think about it like this. Our communion time, being together as we have just shared in our communion time in this worship service, the thing that brings believers together all around the world through, the, the, through all the millennia, the, what brings us together is Jesus Christ. We talked about it last week when we looked at the practice of fellowship or koinonia. Our common bond is Jesus. Communion is our divine opportunity to remember him every time we get together in fellowship. This reminds us so much. What is it that draws us together? What is it that, that this holy, this, this time of, uh, of communion does for us? Well, first it shows us the power of of remembrance. I think we can all agree as a general rule humans are pretty forgetful. You know it's possible that every one of us can think of a time and an, and a, and an incident where uh, we forgot something. Maybe like the, the time that you know you put your glasses up on the top of your head and then you spend time looking around for your glasses. Or more recently, in these last few years, how many of you have forgotten where you, look, where you laid down your, your, uh, your smartphone and then went around the house using the light on your smartphone to try to find your smartphone? <laughs> I think we all can be forgetful. 
But in order to combat our forgetfulness, many of us maybe write notes to ourselves or we put e events on our Google calendars or we, we set alarms on our phone throughout the day. These devices and tips and tricks help trigger our memories and keep us focused on things that matter to us. And in fact, this practice is almost as ancient as humanity itself. In fact, turn with me to the book of Genesis and let's take a look at what was recorded there in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Here the writer records Genesis 12, beginning with verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran and they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and Ai and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord, and he called on the name of the Lord. Now at the end of this passage, you'll notice that Abram built two altars. Both of these were to commemorate these special moments that he had with God. Now if you've read through the Old Testament any time recently, you'll notice that building altars was, was a pretty normal thing back in that day, and many of them are referred to as altars of remembrance. Here's what one biblical commentator says about them. Our altars of remembrance are a symbol of God's faithfulness in the midst of wilderness, change, and transition. It's important to remember those times of God's faithfulness for our future self when doubt and difficulty arise in new ways, but they're also a reminder to future generations. These are the defining seasons of our life story that need to be remembered and shared with our children and grandchildren as a means to point them to God. You catch that? With this in mind, we can see how important it is to remember certain times and certain points of our faith. We can see why a practice like communion, participating in the Lord's Supper, this breaking of bread, is so important as we collectively focus our memories on Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. We can see why the early church was so devoted to this practice, because it was so new, it was so recent, it was so, as like some people would say now, it was still so raw to them. They had lived it. We can also see why it's so important to keep that practice of communion unpolluted and undiluted by our division and anger and sin. And so this points us to the second important lesson that Jesus gives us in communion, that we should seek reconciliation. You know, if we're gonna look at the practice of breaking bread together, we need to make sure that we look at the good and the bad. And with communion specifically, there's something that Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount that's worth us considering today. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 24 to 27, Jesus said, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, You fool! will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them 
and then come and offer your gift. You know, the instruction here is to be mindful of where you take your anger. In this example, when the altar was still a place to make sacrifices, Jesus says, if you're, uh, if you're angry, if you're at odds with another believer, you should go and be reconciled with them before bringing your sacrifice to the altar. And then in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty seven, the Apostle Paul re, uh, warns us about taking communion in an unworthy manner. All of this is to say, I think it's important to remember that taking communion is a holy act of worship for those who believe. It's something for us to, be, to, to realize how special and how important it is. Here's another way to think about it. During communion, we remember Jesus and all that he did on our behalf. He traded his life for ours, for yours, and for mine. So we could be reconciled to God, and we could become co-heirs in the eternal kingdom of God with him. Now that's pretty huge, but that's what Jesus did for us. So it makes sense that we should do all we can to be reconciled with our brothers and sisters in Christ. For us to be at peace with our family and friends and free from sin in our lives. We should be willing to forgive others just as God has forgiven us through his son, Jesus Christ. And we should deal with our anger and our sin before we come to this table and partake and participate in communion. Not because it's some random rule that we need to follow, and definitely not as a way to exclude some people from the communion table, but as believers, we are united in our common bond with Christ. And we should seek unity with, our, with others as much as we possibly can. Think about this. Just imagine for a moment with me an entire church completely devoted to unity, to forgiveness, to charity, to generosity with one another. I know it sounds crazy, maybe idealistic and, and difficult, but if I could dream for a moment, I imagine that this is the kind of community that's described in Acts chapter 2, verses 44 to 47. We read it a while ago, but I want to read this section of our text again. Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 44. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Unity. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the, in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Communion, devoted to being together in all things. And it takes a lot of effort to be of one accord. And it takes a lot of humility to sell our possessions to help provide for others. But in communion, we focus on what we have in common. What is that? Remember, it's our faith in Jesus. We don't focus on what makes us different. We focus on what makes us the same, united. Our focus is on Jesus, our Lord and Savior. In communion, as we come to the Lord's table, we set aside our differences. We set aside uh, our anger and our frustrations so that we can gaze upon and focus upon Christ together with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we can remember his sacrifice for us, for all of us. In communion, we look back, but we also look forward and we celebrate our future hope as one church under Jesus Christ. Remember when Paul records that 
And Jesus even instructed his disciples as he met with them that as you partake of this, uh, then we, we remember, we celebrate, and we look forward to when he comes again and when he will celebrate the true, full communion with us. You know, as we come to a close today, I'd like for us all to take some time to reflect on our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. Where have you seen God in your life? How did you come to faith? How did you come to know Jesus as Savior? And what are some of your favorite things about Jesus? Think about that. And think about the price that was paid to bring us to God. But I'd also like you to look forward to the future. Where do you sense God leading you today, tomorrow, a year, 10 years from now? How do you hope to grow in your faith over these next few years? Are there relationships that you'd like to see reconciled? Are there people that you'd like to be back together with again? You know, every time we take communion, I hope that you're reminded of Luke 1 37 when the angel Gabriel reminds Mary the mother of Jesus nothing is impossible with God God can and will do exceedingly abundantly more than you could ask or imagine you just have to be willing to do what he asks and where he sins let's pray Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to look into your word, to look into the, the life, the history of that first century church and how they were devoted to you, to your son Jesus, and they were devoted to communion, to remember Jesus, and they were devoted to each other. Father, I pray that, that you will help us have that same communion with Jesus, with you, and with each other. Because we know that when we have that true communion, we have and share love. Father, I pray that you will help us to be the example. Help us to share our lives, our love with each other and to everyone around us. Forgive us when we fall short of that, Father. Help us to trust you even more, even with every day that you grant us in our future, so that we can know true communion and fellowship with you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. as the ocean loving kindness as the flood when the prince of life our ransom shed for us his precious blood who is love will not remember who can cease to sing his praise he can forgotten throughout heaven's eternal days on the mount of crucifixion fountains open deep and wide through the flood gates of God's mercy See
as I trust in me, my Lord. Of thy fullness thou art pouring, thy great love and power on me, without measure full.